Hi. Hey. Hey. Yeah. Like, yeah. Messed things up. Welcome, everyone. Echo there as well. Good to see you. Hi. Oh. Oh, moving around. Can you hear me now? Can I hear you? Yep. I can't hear either of you. Oh. This is terrible. What have I done? Ah, this is going to be a classic, I can tell. Do you want us to go? Right, away? everybody. We go away and start I'm going to go away again and come back. I'm just going to restart this broadcast again. Okay. Um, let me try it again. Apologies to Jackie yeah. and to Sarah. <laughs> I can't hear you still. This is uh, this is very annoying. Well, well, let me go and fiddle with some stuff. Listen, Sarah and Jackie, talk yeah. to each other while I'm there. Um, Jackie is a brilliant uh, lecturer and organiser of Newcastle Noir um, and Sarah Vaughan is a writer of amazing books including Anatomy of a Scandal and um, Little Disasters which was just out on April the 2nd. I'm now going to, fiddle, going to fiddle around with some settings and see if I can actually get to hear this because I want to hear what they say so stay with it please. Hi Sarah. Hello, uh, you've been busy, you've just done Newcastle Noir, virtual noir, is that right? That's right, we, we did, we decided that we couldn't let the weekend go without marking it in some way mm. and pre-virus, pre um, I, I must admit to being a dinosaur and a total technophobe um, and was really nervous so decided to record the events just to feel, I'm a bit of a control freak yeah. so just to, um, and we put the the six out live, not live, but recorded, but yeah. put them on the Newcastle Noir Facebook um, page and also the YouTube channel. Um, and then hopefully we're going to do it again at the end of the month with maybe another six or eight panels. Brilliant. Because I, I think originally I, a while ago I got asked to do a panel about consent relating to anatomy. And at the time I thought, oh, my Still not hearing you. And I and I can't justify another weekend away from my kids on on an old book. So um so you know but virtually I mean the the benefit of that is that you know we can we can it's much quicker, isn't it? You don't physically have to travel. Obviously, you can't travel. So you know we can we can all take part in this one. But I'm I'm a technological dinosaur as well. I was convinced I would be the one mucking this up. Not that you're mucking it up, William, but you know, <laughs> the one who wasn't getting the connection here. I find it all quite stressful with technology. I, I, I know, but I think you know, as as we go on in this, so we get used to it. I wonder. I wonder. And then you give us lots of something. long, juicy comments like that. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. I still can't hear you. This is just remarkable. I, saying that? I don't know quite how it's going on. I'm going to try asking some questions there, and I won't be. I won't be able to hear the answers till I see the other other end of it, which is quite a curious way to do interviewing. Have you ever tried an interview? Sarah, you've been a journalist and a proper interviewer. Can you imagine doing an interview where you have to just ask the questions, watch somebody's lips, and you have no idea what is going no. on? But firstly, I'm... Little Disasters, congratulations. Phenomenal book, really phenomenal. And also um, a book about, and the, it's, the clue's in the title, it's about little disasters. It's about tiny little things. I think one, one of the really amazing things about that book is you've managed to write a book that is absolutely gripping, and yet all the events in it and all the tension is based on tiny little incidents, really. I mean, then you don't, you're not, this isn't sort of like um, huge scale things. It's, it, they're really plausible, all the things that go wrong in the book. Was that hard to do and maintain tension? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you're not going to be able to read the answer, are you? Um, uh... Do you know what? I think that the, the novel explores um, maternal mental health, um, postnatal anxiety and maternal OCD. And I think that in that situation, um, characters complete, can completely catastrophize. So, so for something that might seem very small and incidental actually becomes a nuclear explosion. You know, it, it becomes a massive thing. Um, and... And there's a there's a building, isn't there? Of, of, without giving the plot away at all, and there are a building of tiny little 
incremental things and 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 they build up on and actually that they, they have you know there are big ramifications um for what happened and i think actually so many crime novels or certainly psychological thrillers are about little things that could happen to anybody and then there are really bad permutations that come about about them they're about you know it's a you know one small mistake you know or one little lie or you know there's there's there's, there's a tiny little thing but the ramifications of it are huge so um i did this having anatomy was a relative um not a breeze to write but you know it was my fastest book to write and it was a joy to write um and i found this harder i had sort of second album syndrome although actually it's my fourth book um so i went through a lot more drafts and i think that um cutting and pacing it you know c cutting a lot of the drop not not the dross but i had extra chapters of Jess's thoughts and cutting that helped the pace and i think helped the tension I still worry that there are bits that are baggy, but I think you're always very critical of your own books. You know, when you've read it that many times, you can't think objectively about it at all. I'm going to so enjoy listening back to this because for anybody who's just joined, I haven't got a clue what Sarah said, but I know it was fascinating. Did you talk about the process of researching into, if not if you did, and I'll ask another question, but did you talk about the process of researching into the, into the whole sort of thing about paediatrics and things like that? Because you did research that. I did. And that's a really strong part of the book, isn't it? It's not just the, the, the medical accuracy. It's what's going through the minds of these practitioners all the yeah. time when they see a case that comes in of a baby that's injured and how you deal with that. Could you tell us a little bit about your research process there? Yes. Yeah, so my husband is a hospital doctor um, and he isn't a paediatrician, but the, the germ of one of the germs, I guess, of the, of the novel was him coming back from an on-call and looking quite grey and drawn and me saying, oh, what's the problem? And he'd had to make a safeguarding decision. Not it's not his speciality isn't neurology like this baby, but he'd had to um, follow the protocol that's that's quite, I think, obvious in a hospital what you need to do um but you can still make that decision and and then have some doubts about whether you've done the right thing because you know as i said you know the ramifications are going to be absolutely huge for that family so you know according to the hospital protocol you've got to behave in a certain way and you know an injury won't make sense if the explanation is what the parent says um and yet you can still feel unsettled by your decision even if you think it's probably the right decision you know that it's that it's unpleasant for everybody really but of course your duty of care is to your child so that's where the initial thought you know I sort of imbibed that in a way and that was okay but he's not a paediatrician um and I didn't really want to involve him that much if, if you sort of mean I'm, I'm, I'm quite neurotic about getting the details right so I the, the thing about medicine is you specialize in all different areas and he doesn't do pediatrics so I needed to talk to a pediatric neurologist um, I found someone brilliant through the Royal College of Pediatrics who's actually quite a visible presence on Twitter he's writing um, a crime novel he's got an agent um, so he was brilliant he read through he taught me through scans he read through um, bits of copy I was concerned about and then I spoke face to face with three you can see three three paediatricians as well um and, obst and an obstetrician and a perinatal psychiatrist um so and, and a gastroenterologist so i had a whole panoply of doctors that i was emailing um and graham bartlett uh so i got the police stuff right with, with graham as well so so i so i did call on lots of experts to try and try and get it right you've got no idea what i've said have you <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's like flying an aeroplane when you can't see You're being brilliant. where you're heading, but I'm loving it. I think this could probably be the best broadcast ever. The one thing, I've got to come to Jackie in a while and talk about Newcastle Noir because she's just done something fairly amazing with keeping Newcastle Noir going in times like this. Um, but one of the characters, again, if you've talked about this, just go shut up. But um, there's a cat, you write from a child's point of view uh, at one point in the, you know, you, you, you take on, uh, on, um, a child's point of view and it's amazing when you do and also you suddenly realize as a reader how powerful it is when you really restrict a narrator's position what they can say in that book was it hard to to find that voice but presumably incredibly empowering because the moment you begin writing from the children's point of view in this book it's really powerful yeah i thought you, i've never written from a child oh no that's not true actually in my second novel i wrote from a 13 year old's point of view a, a 13 year old child who's then 85 um, later, later on, um, but it came really easy when I write in Frankie. It doesn't have many chapters, but when I wrote in his, and he's the key, isn't he? Um, so when I wrote in his viewpoint, it um, 
it came really easily. And I don't know whether it's, I mean, my youngest is now 12. And I suppose when I was writing this, he was 10. So not that different from eight or nine that Frankie is. But uh, yeah, it was it was, it was was quite liberating. It was lovely to do that. But you've obviously got to be conscious of um, language. I'm writing now in the viewpoint of a 14 year old girl. And I have to keep stopping myself and thinking, although I have got a, 40, I've got a 15 year old girl, although I, I have to keep stopping myself and thinking, you know, I've used too sophisticated language there. And there's a balance because you don't want to be, you don't want it to sound really puerile. You don't want to alienate the reader, but you've got to be totally within the, the mindset of, of that child. Um, so I, I'm sure Frankie's language is a bit more sophisticated than your average eight or nine year old. But yeah, I, I loved writing in his. I, mean, I, don't, I don't think I could sustain a whole book like, um, is it Room that has a five year old's viewpoint all the way through? I think that would be impossible for me to do. But just a couple of chapters there uh, was quite liberating. Well, thank you very I mean, that's brilliant. And, and thanks for everybody saying that you can hear. It's been really useful, all the comments, because you're my interpreters, you people commenting. That way I know that this is going out to somewhere, um, because I'm kind of vaguely lost. But anyway, welcome, Dr. Jackie Collins, Dr. Noir, uh, who I met up in Newcastle in Morstens when you interviewed me and I think Joe Spain some time ago. And you do, you, you've, you, you are a crime fiction fan. You're a, you're a noir film fan and very knowledgeable about, about all that stuff. Um, you lecture up there at uh, Northumbria University, I believe. Um, um, but I, you've just I, done Newcastle Noir. Tell us about the experience of doing Newcastle Noir under lockdown while I, I f watch what everybody says you're saying in the comments. Hi, hi, William. Great to, to see you here um, on, on Facebook Live. Um, doing Newcastle Noir under lockdown, um, when we first took the decision to have to postpone uh, Newcastle Noir 2020, um, it was it was a, a big blow having, as you can imagine, you know, spent the year organising so many fabulous authors that were going to come along, so many people getting ready to come and just be part of a, of a festival where it's 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 community, it's a family, um, and I'd sort of like I don't know resigned myself to it was not going to happen, but talking with a few people and saying, come on surely we can do something whereby at least we can put something on for the weekend. So um, I courage um, uh, and said, yeah, why not? So what we did was we took um, the evening spotlights that we that we had for each each day over the weekend and we took as well the Northern Crime Syndicate authors uh, because, again, wanting to, to highlight the flavour of Northeast writers or Northern writers and put two of those on, on each day as well. So we had six panels uh, and we were able to put those recordings out over the weekend on uh, Newcastle Noir's um, YouTube channel and also on the on the on the Facebook there. Um, I'm really pleased by the way it went. Um, I don't think there's any substitute um, for all of us being able to gather together. But what I did notice was the number of views on those videos and people being able to watch who physically wouldn't have been able to come mm -hmm. uh, to the venue in Newcastle was immense. So again, you know, it, it probably had things that actually were quite good despite the circumstances. I, I don't know whether this is a great thing that maybe interviewers should never listen to the questions and to, to the answers, but um, I was wondering, like, it must be so frustrating in Newcastle right now because Newcastle's done something amazing in this decade, hasn't it? It's reinvented itself as this major cult cultural city. And Newcastle Noir is another extension of that. And to be shut down on all this stuff that the city has begun doing so beautifully must feel like, you know, it must be very tough just being part of that city at the moment. I, I think it is. Because, again, it is a city that um, is always willing to have a go at things, is always willing to find new ideas, uh, new create, you know, creative ventures. And, and you know, I mean, that, that adage that drives me crackers that it's grim up north, um, I, I think it's only ever said by people who've never really been and experience the warmth, the wonderment, um, you know, just the excitement that's there. You know, I have to say, with all due respect um, to all all those lovely uh, people who are London based, um, and and you know, they think that nothing ever happens beyond that perimeter. But the truth of the matter is, you know, 
we're alive and we're well. We might not have the same uh, amount of funding and things like that, but I think we're resourceful. So to come back to your point, William, yes, it's, it is really sad to wander through the centre of Newcastle and see it dead, but it's a city that time and time again, after you know so many economic ravages, I know that the city will be back and will be bringing some awesome things when we're allowed out again to do that. I think I probably have, uh, on the, another thing, I should also say, if you ever see, go to see Jackie in life, and she she's very experienced at interviewing lots of interviews, so she appears at lots of things, check out her threads. She's <laughs> the best dressed interview you will ever have, and also wears some of the finest socks. Um, Keith Walters says, makes a note to check out Newcastle Noir videos, so I presume you've explained that people can now watch these online later and stuff like that, have you? Put, stick your thumb up yes. if you said that. If not... Yeah, uh, let us let people know if you haven't where they can find them. Um, but um, yeah, where, where you where you can find them is uh, Newcastle Noir has its own YouTube, uh, and so those six videos from the weekend are there. You can see which authors are talking from the titles, um, and you know that they will be there in perpetuity. So whenever you can get along and listen to those authors, because again, what we're really keen to do at the minute is knowing that so many authors were ready to release books, were ready to go on tour with things, and that's not been possible. So hopefully, in our own little way, we can help. And it's like I said before that we want to put on another six or eight panels at the end of the month just to give uh, authors that space to talk about their work and share books that they may well be available on ebooks, which is brilliant so yeah i was just trying to watch you on the phone but it's too complicated alison yeah. suggested that the trouble is there's a delay between where we are now and where you are now and my head just basically can't get around it but thanks very much for the suggestion please keep them coming because this is one of the most interesting sides of this. Um, Sarah, you were a journalist for many years yeah. on, the, on The Guardian and things like that, writing political journalism. Yeah. And that's clearly where Anatomy of a Scandal kind of yeah. has its origins in, which was a massive hit and a brilliant sort of thing. Your third book, uh, quite a break from the writing you've been doing in some ways, much, much, uh, probably darker yeah. is fair enough to say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> look at it, thank you. <laughs> that's really handy. Thumbs are really useful on this. Um, but, um, that presumably came out of, did it come out of particular incidents in, in your journalism? Yes, so um, so the idea for anatomy, it's really frustrating you can't hear all this, is um, it came in 2013, November 2013, um, and I was listening to, um, maybe someone can type this, because it won't let me type it at the same time. Maybe you can type subtitles for William. Um, but I was listening to um, a case of a football call for, called Ched Evans and he was appealing against his conviction for in a rape case um, and um, he uh, he was given grounds to appeal and, and actually he was retried and he was acquitted um, but what really upset me at the time was um, the way in which actually it was a it was a columnist Alison Pearson was citing um, comments that other women were making about the 19 year old girl in the case who was paralytically drunk and she'd been picked up in a pizza parlor and then sort of had group sex that, that was alleged to be gang rape um, and uh, I just started thinking about how we view women in rape trials this is way before an, um, Apple Tree Yard had come out or, you know, I'd even heard of Apple Tree Yard. And I had a really, really vivid dream that night about um, a Tory politician who was charged with um, raping a parliamentary assistant, his parliamentary assistant in a, in a lift in the House of Commons. Um, and I knew that I wanted one of the main characters to be the barrister and it could be told by her viewpoint. So, you know, it, it just was fully formed really this idea and then I couldn't write it um, for two years because I needed to write my second novel I was I'd only written my first novel and it was seen as too big a leap to write a book about baking which was my first novel which is really about the impossibility of perfection and motherhood but ostensibly about the baking competition to one about um, consent so that was understandably seen as too big a leap um, so so but the, but the idea was was formulating so sorry long story short uh, yes, uh, it was it was a news story about a rape case, about a rape a footballer accused of raping um, a 19 year old that, that, that made me think of this idea. But also I had worked in the lobby um, and 
I had interviewed uh, when I was in the lobby in November 2004. I had, when I was pregnant with my first child, I'd interviewed the now Prime Minister Boris Johnson, in which he admit, he'd already admitted lying about um, an affair. And I think that had, there was always that sort of sort of shock that a public figure would lie about something like that. So that was a sort of little undercurrent as well that fed into it. Now, one of the things I read about um, Anatomy of Scandal, you said some of the plot points came to you in a, in a dream. Yes, I just said um, that, yeah. And now, is that just because you had everything going round in your head or can I just rely on, can I, should I no, give, give up plotting now and just sleep never, more? Never, ever happened since. Never, despite, it never, never happened again. Never happened. <laughs> so um, it's the one and only time. But, you know, it works. <laughs> yeah, just the once. I understood that. My lip reading's improving. This is fantastic for me. Jackie, I, I mentioned about thing about cinema. Um, and I, I'm just sort of wondering, you're, you, you know, you, you do um, screenings and talk through screenings. Sometimes it's not just um, books. Cinema, we're in trouble, aren't we? Well, are we in trouble or is it a question of are we having to again be creative and find ways of doing things differently, telling different stories in different ways. Um, I just, you know, to, to a friend of mine who, who who lives in Iceland was telling me that that the studios over there are are starting again to film and, and to make things, um, and so yes, in trouble to a certain degree, but maybe again. You know, we will find ways to do this until we can do it in the way that we used to do it. On, on that point, I mean, like Sarah, did um, there were options for Anatomy of the Scandal, presumably. Um, have there been options for Little Disaster? Is anything getting made out of this? Are you seeing anything moving forward? So um, you can't hear this. This is really frustrating. Uh, so Little Disasters hasn't sold yet. So... So Little Disasters, not yet, but, but you know, it's, it's out to producers. So if anybody's listening and interested, I got a lovely email at the weekend from somebody who used to work in TV saying it was exactly the sort of thing they were interested in. Um, but, um, and uh, Anatomy has been, I'm allowed to say this, it's been sold to, I mean, it's, I've been looking at scripts. Um, but uh, coronavirus lockdown has delayed filming, has delayed the, filming <laughs> um, so anatomy, I've been writing um, scripts and it's going to be filmed <laughs> but um, but um, how do I say coronavirus the somebody help me out um, uh, coronavirus uh, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, COVID-19 has meant that there's a delay because obviously there's no filming at the moment um, and uh, actors are all over the place. Actors can't put on makeup or, or be directed at, at present. But I'm very excited about this is, this is going to, filming is going to happen. <laughs> Great. Should I also say, if, if, you want, if you want to get hold of um, Little Disasters, it's currently 99p as an That's ebook, and you should snap it up. And <laughs> yeah, normally it's 50 quid by the look of it. <laughs> I, but uh, Andy yeah. Hill asked, do, does Sarah think we've lost politicians with any real convictions? And I don't mean criminal ones. Oh, that's a good one. Well, um, I quite like Keir Starmer, actually. I think he, he might he might have some convictions. Um, and I was just looking at, there's a, a um, female uh, Labour MP who's also a hospital doctor, isn't there, that's just on the news today. She's been told to tone it down or something by Matt Hancock, and she's just been talking about and you know look at Jess Phillips I've got Jess Phillips's um, books here Let me... sorry okay I think Jess Phillips right. is, a, is a conviction politician isn't she so uh um I'm actually writing about a politician for my new novel um so I, I do think that we do have some I'm I am as you might guess from the fact that and I, I love it when people actually sell other people's books yeah. Um, uh, anatomy was partly inspired by. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm very sorry that the prime minister has been in intensive care, obviously, and has been very poorly. Um, but I'm not a huge fan of, of him. Um, but, um, that's you, you don't want politics on here, do you? But um, I think that uh, yeah, I'm not sure we've had conviction politicians recently. But I don't know. Perhaps, perhaps 
perhaps this whole crisis we're going through is, is going to change things. I mean, I think environmentally it will have to change things, won't it? I mean, perhaps politically it's going to change things as well. I mean, who knows? I think we're living in such an uncertain time. Hold up notes, you said. <laughs> um, I think he's getting the gist. Jackie, this whole sort of um, oh, it's a good real love of crime fiction, was it the storytelling that got you? To, what was the thing that got you into crime fiction? Mm, good question, William. Uh, I, 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 it, for me, it was first and foremost, it was the place um, because I, I, you know, I can't deny and say that my first love is for crime fiction and translation. Um, and so those, you know, dark spaces in the north, those very warm spaces in the south, um, because for me they are novels that don't only deal with the crime, which I think is, you know, I love the mysteries and things, but I love being transported to another place. So for me it, it was that, it was crime in translation and going to another place. And do you see any, I mean, like in the time you've been in doing Newcastle Noir, do you see any major trends? Do you think it's changing much? Is it continuing to evolve as a form since you've been um, doing this stuff? Wow. Yeah. OK. So a, a, a difficult question to pull all the different strands together that are certainly emerging. I think one of the wonderful things about the crime genre is it fabulous that that flexibility that's there and the way that authors, you know, continue to push those boundaries and, and you know, and, and try to bring us a fresh take on the crime story. I think so long as there's a crime, then I think you can weave any kind of narrative behind it. Um, I know this has been said before over more recent years, but that idea that, you know, it is now the genre that, that really brings those questions up about what is going on in our society and, and helps us get to grips maybe with some of those really difficult questions um, that if we face them full on in reality, we might not want to look, look at them being brought to us by crime writers, um, then you know we can begin to consider them. So, so definitely. Um, what I would say as well, though, I think is you know, to think about Sarah's writing um, and bringing... Um, you know, bringing the crime story inside our own lives into the home, that, that, that crime isn't just something that happens, you know, in, in big corporations or it's not just gangland stuff, but it's actually that everyday life element to it. And I think that's what's made it very exciting uh, in, in more recent times. Mm. Um, um, actually, I've got to go back to my book, doesn't it? Sorry. Alison asked, um, well, you know, when you write your novels, do you get emotionally involved, especially, you know, like when it came to the writing the, the sort of rape side of um, Anatomy of a Scandal? Did, was, is that hard? Yeah, so um, with anat Anatomy, it was actually quite cathartic. I realised in writing it that I was actually drawing on my own experience of a sexual assault in my early 20s. But I, I suddenly found myself talking about at Guildford Literary Festival, you know, eight months after it was published, I'd, I'd, I'd said to my press officer and my editor, I wasn't going to discuss it on anything. And then suddenly I found myself in front of lots of women with Louise Candler, um just suddenly telling everybody about the sexual assault when I was in my early 20s and how that had been a, something that had influenced it. Um, uh, so... Yeah, I certainly drew on that, even if I wasn't consciously sort of weeping over my laptop while I was doing that. I did find, so just in the same way that the book I'm currently working on, I, I followed a murder trial for two weeks uh, back in January. And I'm really glad I did before lockdown happened. For anatomy, I followed a, I went to the Bailey and watched a barrister in a sexual um, assault case. And then completely coincidentally, I, um, I, followed her in a trial, a rape trial. I arranged to follow her in a trial um, over a week in a, in, a, in a county court. And I found that, I, you know, I, I found that really upsetting actually. I mean, obviously I didn't show it, but just, there are moments in a trial where a witness's voice, a complainant's voice will just crack. And as the barrister said, you'll know at that point she's telling um, the complete truth. And sometimes it's in just completely little incidental little details like something that the defendant has said to her and that was the case with this and you know that that's something that that woman hasn't made up you know and that that's the sort of casual contempt that 
a rapist says to 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 the woman he's raping and it's that sort of little detail that just sort of breaks your heart i remember years ago i followed the um the first sexual offenses um trial of the disgraced dj jonathan king um and he was accused of raping or sexually assaulting sorry uh, lots of 13 year old boys in care homes in surrey and there was just a there was just a horrible detail which i won't repeat here because it's quite graphic um and I would have been in my mid twenties. Was well, it was two thousand and one, um, and I just remember hearing that, and that, and this now broken thirty year old boy and his man in his mid thirties who'd had you know drug convictions, who'd never really had a proper job, who had mental health issues, and he'd been broken by his experience. And this line just rang around the courtroom and resonated so much, and was the sort of emotional heart of the trial, really. So yes, it's it's. Um, it's hard not to be affected, but I think it's that sort of journalistic thing in the same way that, you know, my husband being a doctor can't be crying over his patients or a social worker like the characters in uh, Little Disasters can't be crying over their, the, the children they're looking after or a, t or a teacher involved in a safeguarding issue. You've got to use your anger about these things um, to, to make you hardened and forensic in your writing, I think. That's okay. Yeah. Um <laughs> it's amazing how much you get actually out of people's answers just from really watching closely. But um, Jackie, Andy, Hill, and I hope I'm not, I hope I haven't talked to anybody or spoiled the mood of a question when I come in with the next answer. But, you know, it's not the simplest thing I've done. Andy Hill, who's been a great follower of this and comes in, also a great fan, and he's a writer himself, says, Jackie, does Jackie have any a book she's read this year which has taken her breath away? Which is the kind of question I hate, because at that point my brain goes completely blank. But is there anything you've read, Jackie? I wonder if I would be allowed to say who um, uh, that I've read. Um, and it, it gives me great pleasure to say that they are two novels with a great northeast flavour. One of them is by debut author Trevor Wood, The Man on the Street. And what what struck me about that is something that I was saying before, the fact that this novel, a fresh perspective uh, on the crime novel, because it's from the point of view of uh, a rough sleeper um, from a homeless man, um, and, and it just gives you a, a totally different perspective as well on on being in, in Newcastle. Um, and again, and a great crime story behind. So Trevor Wood, The Man on the Street, would be the first one. And then the other one uh, would would be Judith O'Reilly's uh, Curse the Day, um, because she has given me a, a protagonist that I've fallen in love with in her Michael North. He's sort of like a Bond born cross. Um, but again, what took my breath away about the novel was were, were the, the topics that she was broached. In, uh, all around uh, the issue of uh, AI uh, and, you know, what could be the, the demise of the human being. So Judith O'Reilly's Curse of the Day and Trevor Wood's The Man on the Street. Now, I know you like mm. Trevor Wood's Man on the Street because my kind people have told me that's one of the ones you mentioned, so communication does work. Mm. Listen, I try and keep this around half an hour because uh, it, that, I think that's as much as as um, anybody can take and it's been the most interesting experience thank you so much everybody for making the comments so i have some clue about what's going on for know that people are listening um i'm going to go switch this off and, and listen to it because it sounds fascinating to me i want to thank jackie uh for being here but also just for the brilliant stuff you do in support of crime writers and the crime writing community and You'd be fools to yourselves if you don't buy uh, Little Disasters. It's absolute masterclass in how to make a really gripping book out of the small things that um, happen to everybody. I mean, like I was reading that the first bit, any parent, the, first, the, the prologue will make any parent's heart go, <gasps> because we've all been in that situation, which is a very clever way of uh, drawing us all in. So my thank you so much. I was going to say, my, my daughter wants commission on that. <laughs> Whatever that was, uh, it's, it's a pleasure. I'm, I'm going to bid you all goodbye. Thank you so much for coming on and thanks for putting up with what has been quite an eccentric um, performance. But uh, see you all again and see you in the flesh at some point, I hope. Bye.